All right, guys, we are in chapters 8 and 9. This is actually a larger argument that Paul is making from 8 all the way to 11.1, but we're going to split it up. So we're going to do chapters 8 and 9. It's a little bit long of a reading. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist." However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, Will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? As do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends to a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox who, when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we weep material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commended that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I did not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Okay. What is Paul concerned about here? What is the point of all of this? Don't cause your brother to stumble. What does he mean by that? What, what, well, first of all, what does it mean to, to stumble? Well, to sin. Yeah. Um, Paul's instructions here is he starts out by saying, um, remember, the Corinthians have a false understanding of what spirituality is. They think... I'm spiritual because I know that there's nothing, nothing about an idol. There's no such other God than the God who exists. And so I'm free to eat the meat that is sold um, that was once sacrificed to idols. And they might have even thought, I'm free to go into the temple and eat it there at the celebration. Because I realize this is a celebration of nothing. Now he's going to address this more in chapter 10. Um, of whether or not, not they should actually t- partake in the celebrations themselves that are religious. But here they think, well, I know that this is okay for me to do. There's nothing wrong with it. And Paul says, you're absolutely right. There is nothing wrong for how you handle a created thing. All created things are made by God, and they're for you. And if you eat, eat them in gratefulness to God, you're thankful for them, you're free to have them. However, knowledge isn't the goal. Love is the goal. To be loved by God is the goal. And that's why he says, I don't, you know, we don't, we don't really know as we ought to know. However, what we really should be concerned about is whether we're known by God. Now he's using the word know to talk about a relationship that you actually have a relationship with God. And knowledge actually doesn't tell you if you have a relationship with God. What tells you if you have a relationship with God is whether or not you care about the other people who are in God, whether or not you love them. And some people, because they have so lived the life that they have lived, cannot disassociate some created things from the evil that has often surrounded it. And so when you partake in those things and you pressure them to partake, even though they're not fully convinced in their minds that it's not sin, they feel like they want to be a part of your group. They feel like they want to be a part, and so they'll go ahead and partake. But because down deep they're not fully convinced by their own faith that it's okay, what you have done is drawn them into what was not going to be a sin if they had thought that it was okay, now is actually a sin. I want you to turn real quick to Matthew chapter 18. Um, This is probably one of the most terrifying verses. I think it's the most terrifying verse in the entire Bible. Uh, Starting in verse 1, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child, uh, had him stand among them, and said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn around and become like this, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. Now I want you to listen to this. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, by the way, it's the same terminology as, as to stumble, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone, uh, millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the open sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. It is necessary that stumbling blocks come, 
but woe to the person through whom they come. Now, um, basically what's that, what, what is that saying? That's basically saying instead of actually causing a Christian to sin, now here obviously you could say, well, it's, the, it's just the child who's a Christian, but actually in Matthew that's, that's applied to any Christian at all. Um, the least of these brothers of mine. Um, Christ actually says, it would be better for you to commit suicide in the most horrific way, better for you, than for you to make another Christian sin. It is extremely important that we understand this. Because although we don't have food that's being sold from the marketplace uh, that comes from temples, what do you think this might apply to in our culture? Alcohol. Now, I think you can apply it to other things. Look, if, if we were in India, it, it might apply directly. But in our culture, I can't really think of anything else that is prominent to where I would say we associate something with sin, some people do, than alcohol. You are fully free. You can drink alcohol. God has made it for a good that you partake in. You should enjoy him through it and be thankful for it. But if someone's not convinced in their own mind if they still associate it with clubbing, partying, just getting drunk, uh, uh, the sexual immorality that surrounds it, the, the cursing that surrounds it, whatever, all of the evil that typically surrounds it in our culture, if they have not fully disassociated it from that, and then they are pressured by you, either because you're trying to convince them to partake in alcohol, um, because you want them to see that it's a good. You might have good intentions. But it ends up being a pressuring. Or just by virtue of you pressuring them, like, uh, you, you know, you, you really only have your group that hangs out with you because you all drink alcohol. Those are the only people who are going to be invited to your, your little in-group. Guess what? Everybody wants to be a part of that in-group. So now you have placed a temptation and a pressure on a Christian who thinks that it might be sin for him to partake, but he's now going to partake because he wants to be part of your group. You're in the Matthew 18 category. Just to be really clear, in case you did not get that, Christ is actually saying you're going to hell. It is a serious thing. I do not want it dismissed by anyone in this church when this is brought up. It is serious. That's why Paul comes to the conclusion. This is a crazy conclusion. If, if meat causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again. Can you imagine that? You're never going to eat meat again. It's not like they have multiple options in the ancient world to eat. Like you've got bread and meat, occasionally vegetables, but not usually. And Paul's saying, I'll just eat bread from now on then. That's how serious this is. Would that it be that those of us who see that alcohol is completely fine and good say to ourselves, if I'm going to pressure anyone, either by having an in-group that drinks alcohol that other people aren't invited to, or just by trying to pressure people by, hey, man, you got you to gotta believe this is good. This is good for you. This is good for you. Like, yes, we need to teach it. That's what I'm doing right now. But there's a difference in teaching and pressuring. There's a difference in teaching and, and basically displaying that you're not a part of my in-group. You're not fully accepted by me um, because you don't partake in this. And then someone ends up wanting to partake. Oh, man. Woe to the, those through whom the stumbling blocks come, Jesus Christ has said. You should tremble at this. It is extremely serious. And I want you to notice, 
There's a weak and a stronger brother. We're going to read the passage in Romans as well. Uh, also kind of long, but it, it's, it's worth it. Romans 14 and 15. There's a weak and stronger brother. The, the responsibility is always on the stronger brother, not the weak. Um, it is, there, is a, there is a responsibility for the weak not to judge the stronger brother. And we'll talk about that. And Paul talks about it in 10. We'll talk about that next week. But the, the larger responsibility is on the stronger. Because supposedly he is the more mature. He should know better. If his faith is so much greater, his faith should be so much greater in understanding love. And that's Paul's point, of course, in Corinthians, right? If you're spiritually mature, it has nothing to do with your knowledge. Yeah, you know that it's good, it's good and God doesn't have a problem with you t- partaking in it. Good for you. What are you going to do with that knowledge now? Are you going to love yourself or are you going to love God and his people? Well, you're infringing on my rights. I have the right. How dare you tell me I can't do this? And Paul goes off and says, how dare you tell me that I can't get married? I don't have the right to get married. I have the right. I gave up that right to minister to you and the other churches. How dare you tell me I don't have the right for you guys to support me financially? I, what, what is worth more? What Paul has given the Corinthians or all the riches of the Corinthians combined given to Paul, if they were to give him everything they had, what's worth more? What Paul gave them, not what they've given Paul. In fact, they don't give Paul anything. But even if they had, it's still not worth more than what he gave them. And yet Paul says, I deserve this. It was my right. God has actually said it that way that ministers are to be supported by those to whom they are ministering. But I gave it up. Because some of you stumble over it, I gave it up. Um, I now can say, I've preached the gospel to you freely. I had the right to take it, but I gave that right up. It's not about getting your rights. It's about using your rights, and your freedom in Christ to love others. And that's why he finishes this off in nine by saying um, that, look, I'm free in, in verse 19, 919. I'm free from all I can make myself a slave to all in order to gain even more people. So basically, I, I, I have complete freedom. I'm not a slave to anybody. I can do what I want. But what, how am I going to use it now? Well, I'm going to actually mimic the people I'm around so that they can be around me. I'm not going to set up roadblocks or hoops they have to jump through. And certainly, I'm not going to pressure them to do what is sin in their minds to hang around me. I'm going to become like them. I'm not going to make them become like me. So to the Jew, I'll become a Jew. Oh, you guys are eating kosher? I'll eat kosher. You guys are doing the washings? I'll do the washings. To the Gentile, I'll become like a Gentile. They're not observing any of that. I'm not going to observe any of that. To those who drink, I'll drink. To those who don't, I won't. but it's about loving other people and having your mind on other people rather than your own rights. You want to know why people get upset about this issue? They get upset because they think you're infringing on my rights and what I want to do. That's why people get upset. We need to listen to this word and say, okay, I need to love. How am I including the most amount of Christians that I can uh, by the way I use created things. Rather than, well, I have the right to use all these things in the way that I want them, and if you want to be around me, then you'll have to conform to that. Because now I'm pressuring you. Because you may want to be around me, but now I'm making you actually possibly sin in order to be around me. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans, just a few pages before, really. Chapter 14 and 15. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. 
One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats it in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or do you, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to, of himself to God. Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our, our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, notice it's a lot of other things as well, then. It's, it's holidays. It's uh, uh, probably even Sabbath days. It's wine. It's food. It's any created thing. We're not talking about morality, Right? It's not like, oh, I'm free to do whatever moral... Th no, 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 no. He's talking about... In fact, in, in uh, Corinthians, he's talking about, look, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not under the law as though I'm going to be condemned by the law of God. I am under the law of Christ, which I think Paul means by that, the moral law. Um, so he can't do away with morality, depending on who he's around. But foods, wine, what days he observes, all that is a matter of, well, you know, who's... Who's here? Who am I around? Uh, how can I actually maximize the amount of people to include them rather than exclude them by what I'm doing? Now, I want you to notice, this is not about things that you like or dislike. That's not what any, that, this is so taken out of context by people. This is not about like, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I don't like uh, the fact that Brian wears hats, let's say. Okay. Are you sinning? No. So this has nothing to do with it. This is talking about someone wrecking your moral compass and pressuring you to do what is against your moral compass 
uh, by you pressuring you to partake in things that you associate with sin so that it becomes sin for you. In other words, it's causing you to sin in your mind. And you're doing it because you feel pressured by it. That's what this is talking about. Otherwise, it's saying, look, you're not to judge, like, you're not to judge a bunch of people. If a bunch of Christians want to get together and they're um, playing cards and uh, drinking alcohol or whatever, you're not to sit there and be like, oh, what a bunch of lowlifes. You're not to do that as the weaker brother. But you're also not to get together and constantly play cards to where the weaker brother is excluded and feels like he has to drink alcohol too in order to be around you guys. Um, because now you're actually tempting him and he might fall and ruining someone's conscience, ruining someone's moral compass is extremely dangerous. Uh, I remember like there was a girl now, this is, this is a Mormon girl, right? Um, so she wasn't a Christian. We we're trying to actually get her to, to accept Orthodox Christianity. And by doing that, we destroyed Mormonism in her mind. The problem is, is that she didn't receive Orthodox Christianity, but her morality was connected to her Mormonism. So that when we destroyed it, we destroyed her morality and she became extremely immoral, throwing that girl into complete judgment. Now, I think that you should risk that when you preach the gospel. Um, that is a risk. You're going to throw someone into further judgment. However, I want you to take that and understand some people's moral compass is connected to created things. Some Christians' moral compass is connected to created things. And when you get them to sin or rebel in those areas, you're, t you're actually ruining their actual moral compass. To where you might send them into further sin against God. Paul saying, don't do that. Be very clear. Don't do that. Rather abstain if you need to. In order, instead of doing that. Have, have any of you ever been pressured or feel like you've been pressured? Or have any of you pressured people unknowingly? Um, because you thought, oh, well, I want other people to feel like this is good. And so you're just trying to get them to partake in something that they actually down deep feel kind of it's not good. Probably. Jesse. Yeah, like, um, like I, I know, like I have served alcohol in my home before when I shouldn't have, and I didn't know there was, or I didn't just, I didn't realize there was someone there who had set temptation for to sin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or I might have even, I think there was a time where I even knew it and then I, I forgot it, you know? I just, so, yeah, I, I blame the people. Yeah. And, so, and it's easy to do because you're not, not thinking, right? Right. I'm just, I just want to do what's going to be nice for everyone. Right. And I'm not like taking the time to think, like, is this the way God is speaking? Yeah. Right? Yeah, there, there's often good intentions, right? But it, it's kind of like, I think you nailed it by saying you weren't thinking. Because it, it ultimately, we have good intentions, but there's a way of having good intentions and thinking about it and not thinking about it. Like, there's a way, like, I don't know if you've ever come across, there are people at Christmas who will give you presents that they like. And then there are people who will give you presents that you like. Paul's actually kind of saying, be the type of person that gives the present that the guy actually likes, not something that you like. Be thoughtful about it in terms of, hey, I don't have a problem with this. I think this is completely good. Is everybody that is actually feeling that you know, they can be a part of this or whatever, do, does anybody here have a, an issue with it? Because if not, then you know, we're just not going to partake in this particular thing. And it's okay because we can do without it. Because what Paul says in Romans is, is actually it's not necessary for you to either partake or to abstain, to be welcomed by God. Because God has welcomed both the weak and the strong. And if God has welcomed both, why do you have an extra barrier to welcome them? 
Who are you to exclude the servants of the Almighty God who are not your servants? Who are you to have some extra barrier to fellowship with you when God doesn't have that barrier to fellowship with him? You understand why this is an evil, even though we might have good intentions. And I think all of us, frankly, are guilty of it. Like, we just want people to know the truth. We just want people to understand. You can partake in things now. It's okay. Um, But we need to understand that we might actually be wearing away their conscience. We might actually be searing it, making them numb to where we're, we're throwing them off into even apostasy. Right, that's, that's what Paul is actually dealing with. Yeah, and there's this um, negative perception of the weaker brother. Yeah. And that, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have to accommodate this person. And they should just figure it out themselves. And the attitude is really the biggest issue. Well, the attitude is the selfishness. It just shows that the knowledge has puffed up, which is what he started with, rather than cause to love. Um, and so this is important. Again, if you think knowledge is spirituality you'll think you're spiritual because you have the knowledge that it's okay for you to participate in. But Paul's point is that's not spiritual. He, he even says, look, we all have knowledge. Good for you that you know. Big whoop, the devil knows and he's going to hell. Who cares? That does no good for anyone. It's what you do with that knowledge And that's why he says in Romans, why should you despise your brother, the brother for whom Christ died? Who are you to despise? And by the way, that word despise just means you think lesser of them. You think think they're lower than you. Is the weaker brother less spiritual than you? There's a great question right there. Is the weaker brother who doesn't partake in the certain created things because he can't disassociate them from other things, is he less spiritual than you? Well, I, w- I would argue no. But what I'm saying is you don't, you know which person is, you know if the stronger or the weaker is more spiritual in every, in every case. Well, that's what I mean. What I'm saying is it has nothing to do with spirituality. But, yeah, and that's what, I guess the, we're getting at the same thing. It's yeah. It's like saying you can't know based on this issue. Right. Whether the, the weaker brother is the stronger spiritually or the weaker spiritually. Right. The, the question, again, if Corinthians is arguing that spirituality, spiritual maturity is love then the question is, who loves the most? Who cares about other Christians the most? Who loves God the most? That's the most spiritual person. Not who abstains, who partakes in created things that God has made. You're You're free to partake, you're free to abstain, but God welcomes both. So one is not more spiritual than the other. You would think, oh, well, but the one has less faith to disassociate those things. But Paul's point is that that's not less spiritual, though. That may that be a, maybe a, an amount of growing in a particular knowledge area and becoming more acquainted with it and becoming more at ease with it and your feeling toward it. But spirituality is love, and so whoever loves the most, he is most spiritual. And when you, um, I came a little late, but when you talk about the weaker brother or sister, obviously, um, uh, are you talking, is that compared to like somebody who has an addiction or who has had an addiction? No, it's, it's talking about someone who, in, they're weaker in their faith to where they, they don't realize or they, they can't disassociate a created thing like alcohol or uh, meat sacrificed on idol or something like that from the actual evil activity that sur- has surrounded it in their life. And so because of that, they don't feel like they should partake in it. Um, but now they're being pressured maybe by a stronger brother that they should partake because it's perfectly okay. And they therefore think that really down deep they're sinning against God. And so if they, as Paul says in Romans, if they partake in it, even though it was a good thing for someone else, if they partake in it, it is sin for them. 
Because now they, look, if you feel like you're rebelling against God, should you do that thing? Even if there's no explicit verse or anything that actually condemns what you're doing, I would actually pause and say, okay, because I feel like it is, because I've not come to a place where I feel like it isn't, I've not come to that knowledge and understanding and faith, I should not do that thing. It does relate to it in the sense that if the person who has the addiction usually cannot disassociate it from the actual getting drunk. If you're talking about like, you know, uh, alcohol or getting high, if you're talking about drugs or something like that. Although I don't think we're free to partake. In it. I think most drugs are immediate drunkness. So you're not free to partake in that because you're not free to partake in drunkenness. But, um, but for the person who, let's say that they, they were an alcoholic, um, and they can't disassociate for them if they feel like, well, it would be sin for me to partake. In no way should they partake. And in no way should we ever pressure someone either through our own words or just by basically excluding people. Because that's what really happens. And at the end of the day, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pressure people two ways, like I said. We're either going to try to just push them with our words to partake in it and to agree with us superficially, but down deep they still don't. Or we're just going to exclude you. You're not going to be invited. And man, everybody wants to be invited. So that's putting pressure on people to partake. So would you say that pretty simply that if you know somebody uh, was an alcoholic or struggles with that or whatever, it's better just not to serve yeah. alcohol for Yeah, get rid of it. Why do we need alcohol? We don't worship alcohol. We worship Christ. Why, why do we need it? Why, why, why do we need it? Like Paul is saying, like, look, if there are people that are going to be among us or they're going to be excluded because they feel like they have to eat meat, let's get rid of the meat. Because you know what? We don't need it in order to be welcomed by God because God has welcomed us through Christ. So we can go ahead and give up our rights. That's his whole point. I gave up my rights. Uh, you guys should have been supporting me. You're not. So what did I do? Well, I worked with my own hands and other churches supported me instead to serve you. Now, this is actually, in a way, he is saying to the Corinthians, you know, you should have actually supported me. <laughs> but his point is, is that I can give it up, though. It's not needed. Um, I can give up being married in order to minister all these churches and do all these missionary journeys. I, being married wouldn't make sense for me. I can give that up. I have the right to it, but I don't need it. We don't need alcohol. It's not something you need. If you need it, then it's an idol. Now it's a problem. And if you need it to such a degree that you have to like risk the moral compass of your brother, risk loving your brother, risk uh, actually causing him to sin, man, that, that's just dangerous. Again, Matthew 18, you want to risk that? You're not just risking him. I think what Christ is saying, what Paul's trying to say as well is you're risking your own soul at that point. Jesse in the gray zone. Um, okay, so we've got someone here who uh, doesn't esteem, who esteems all days of life, right? And so we're going to do a Christmas Eve service, and like, why would you be sitting if I go to Christmas Eve service? Because, you know, yeah. Christmas trees are Satan trees or whatever, you know? Are we, are we, we have Christmas trees at the Christmas service? No, but whatever. Yeah, I can't. So we probably have like, like, not convinced like Christmas people, right? Um, Right. 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 I mean, you don't have any anyway, but you're definitely not going to get any. 
Yeah, so I, I think the idea is that those things that you're getting together where you're just getting together with people who are going to partake in whatever you're doing or whatever, um, one, I wouldn't make it a church thing. It should never be a church event. But even that, we need to be careful because it can technically not be a church event even though it really is. Um, you can take away from church events by having your own thing. Uh, you can, you know, an exclusive, a, a thing that excludes. I would keep it on the down low. I wouldn't advertise. I wouldn't make it seem like people are being excluded at all. Uh, if you want to have people over who they all like, you know, like to, to have a glass of whatever cognac or whatever people drink, I don't know. Um, but what, but what, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever, vodka, uh, uh, Everclear, whatever you're, whatever you're drinking. Um, but if you want to have a group of people over, that's fine. The problem becomes if you have a regular group of people and you guys are all discussing like the things that frankly are theological and you're pressing into one another and, and now it looks like it's kind of church. But I'm not really feeling like I can be a part unless I go and drink alcohol. I don't feel like I'm one of the one of the group, uh, that's where the problem lies. So I would avoid that at all costs. I'm not saying, hey, you can't get together and do things that you all like and go, you know, get together and watch a movie. And some people, oh, I don't like watching movies or I don't think watching movies are great or whatever. It's like, that's fine. But if all you do is get together and go watch movies, now you're excluding the people who feel like, oh, it's a sin to watch a movie. Although I don't, I don't know. There are some people who believe that, but I mean, I don't think there are many people who believe that. But you get the point, right? It's, it's am, I, am I regularly excluding someone to where they feel like if they don't partake in this, they're not going to be in that group. And they want to be in that group. They want to be welcome. And I think it's interesting that Romans uses that terminology. He uses it both for you and for God. He actually says that God has welcomed them. And so welcome your brother and not for the purpose of disputing over this issue. So don't welcome him in so you can teach him your way to conform to you, that's not why you're welcoming him. You're welcoming him because he's welcomed by God and letting him know you're received by me. You don't have to partake in anything I partake in, man. Don't feel pressured by it. This is essentially Are you talking about like theology and ethics or something? No. So th this is you're not to teach a different theology and ethics. And that's why I say he's not talking about morality. He's not talking about theology. He's talking about created things. Notice the examples he gives. Days, meat, wine. Like it's stuff that's created. Stuff that is amoral. Uh, it's how you use these amoral things. You're free to use anything God has made in the created world for good, to worship him. You're not free to participate in uh, wickedness. You're not free to believe falsehood. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because in that case, you're becoming a stumbling block in a very different way. You're actually becoming a false teacher, um, which, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other lesson. Uh, don't become a false teacher as a lame. People think, well, I'm not a pastor. I couldn't be a false teacher. It's like, no, no, no. All you have to do is spew something false, and you become a false teacher, something that wrecks their faith, something that gets them to sin, and now you're actually guilty of that Matthew 18 passage. Well, yeah, that's for for them. It is if they think it's something they should do. I mean, we'll, we're coming up on the head covering thing we're going to talk about. But uh, for people who believe they should do it, but for people who believe that that's what First Corinthians eleven is saying, I would. I, this is actually a great point. I wouldn't try to convince them. Like I'll try to convince them through teaching, but I would try to pressure them to not wear a head covering. 
because now you're pressuring them to, in their mind, sin. So don't do that. Um, well, see, I actually say, I don't think it goes the other way. I think it just goes for the weaker brother because if they pressure you to wear a head covering, you don't think wearing a head covering is a sin. So it actually doesn't, doesn't go the other way. The same thing, like if someone's pressuring you to not drink, you don't think not drinking is a sin. So you're actually fine with it. So you're, you're the okay one. It's so actually okay. The weaker brother pressuring you actually isn't a problem. That, that, Paul doesn't care. Paul cares about getting someone who thinks it's a sin to actually in their mind then sin. That's the problem. Right. But if you're just like, but if the other person is just upset because you do it, and right. Not tempted, it's right. Like the, like the head covering thing. If someone just thinks head coverings are legalistic, for right. example, as like, well, you're like, you need to stop because I'm offended by you. I'm the, even if I'm the weaker brother, stop. Right. Covering. It's like, well, are you tempted to wear a head covering? Right. You know? Well, and that's why I gave the example of a bunch of guys playing cards and drinking alcohol. This isn't talking about you sitting aside and be like, those people are sinners. That's not what it's talking about. Because remember, what did the Pharisees say of Christ? Oh, he's a drunkard and a glutton because he eats and drinks. Christ doesn't care about that. That's not the, that's not the point at all. Uh, the point is, are you pressuring someone to do what they think is a sin? Because you have knowledge that it's not a sin. But they don't have that knowledge. They haven't, they haven't made that connection. I don't mean just knowledge in the sense of cognitively. I think most people, as Paul says this, probably this has been said to everyone. Hey, you know what? Idols are nothing in the world. There's only one God. Uh, this meat is, is nothing. It's okay. You can actually eat it. But down deep, their spidey sense tells them, man, I really feel like this is rebellion against God, but okay, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Now it's sin for you. You have to be, that's why he says you've got to be fully convinced in your own mind, not going off of someone else's conscience, not going off of someone else's moral compass. It's got to be yours. Yeah, Ritesh? You're making the argument that her, she not wear it or she wear it? Well, it, it matters which way. Yeah, well, she should wear it because her husband said for her to wear it. It's not, she doesn't believe it's sin to wear it, right? So she, you're fine. The issue would be if, if she believes it's a sin to not wear it. Now, as her husband, I would say to you, do not wreck your wife's conscience. Right. 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 Yeah. I, I tell Allison all the time, I'm like, look, you can part, and sometimes she'll, she'll drink or whatever when she's out with you guys or something. Um, I mean, drink, she'll take, she'll have like a sip or something. But, but in, in, if I ever for one, because she grew up as a Baptist, if I for one, th one moment thought she still thought that was sin, I'd be like, whatever you do, don't do that. If you love your wives, don't pressure your wives to do what they think is sin. Again, slowly teach them and make sure they are fully convinced in their own minds first. Because if they're not, You've just hated the person that you made in covenant to love more than anyone else. I've heard a, a play devil's advocate. Um, my wife should be in submission to my teaching. Um, if I'm telling her that uh, it's, it's not sin for her to not wear a covering, then she should do what I'm telling her to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, l- let's lay the foundation there, right? Can, uh, we're to be in submission to government, right? Can government tell you to sin? But you're to be in submission to it. You should be following government and their direction and their authority. How dare you? They don't have the authority to tell you to sin, right? right? Your husband does not have the authority to tell you to sin. And how dare he? As the church, I'd come over him and say, what are you doing, dude? You're telling your wife to do something that she thinks is sin? She's wrong. It's not sin. But she feels it is. And you are ruining her conscience, given her by God, that she's using to worship God right now. And you're destroying it. You're in sin. Stop doing it. Right, it's over a created thing that she did. Yeah, if yeah, it, it has. Well, I, I I don't know if if it's a moral thing, he shouldn't be telling her to do something. You mean if he's telling her to do what's moral? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but now. Right. Now, if it's a matter of like, I think head covering, you know, the, the, the woman thinks the head coverings are pretty and the man doesn't. I don't know why he wouldn't. I think they're, they look good. But, um, but let's say he doesn't or whatever, but it has nothing to do with sin, then she should submit to her husband and not wear it. But if she thinks it's a matter of like, no, God told me to wear a head covering. I, I, I don't want to disobey God. That husband is in sin for telling her to not wear it. This is, it's such an important point. We just we don't get this in Christianity. We get this kind of blanket. No, no, my wife should do whatever I say, and then and then I I know people who who say, well, uh, if I tell my wife to jump off a cliff, then she should. I think Bill Gothard says something like that. It's like, are you kidding me? No, that's not true because he doesn't have the authority to tell you to sin against God, and jumping off the cliff would be sinning. He's sinning by telling you that. So same thing here. Look, husbands, love your wives. If they think something is sin, you, you want to foster their moral compass, not wreck it. You want them to, to slowly bring them along in knowledge. Not, not push them into things all of a sudden. Oh, no, just, just try it. It's fine. No, it's not fine. You're destroying them. You're ruining the work of God, Paul says. You're destroying your brother for whom Christ died. You're destroying your wife that you're supposed to be sacrificing yourself for. Not looking for your rights. Not looking as, as a way to justify your own actions. And, oh, I want my wife to do this because it makes me feel better. No, you're sacrificing yourself for your wife. That's what Christ does for the church. That's why Paul brings up Christ. Christ didn't take his rights. Christ, Christ had every right not to die. He had every right not to suffer the pain that he suffered and the humiliation he suffered. He did not take those rights for your sake, out of love for you. Love one another likewise. Well, it, it, it may be an objectively sin, right? I mean, it may, it may objectively be a sin, right? Yes, yes. Um, so, and he's telling you to do what you think is sin? Um, encouraging it, encouraging it. Um, it would have to be, in order for, it to, this, for, for this particular thing to apply, it would have to be he's pressuring you yes. to do what you think is sin. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, actually, so he, he does talk about even the unbeliever who also does not disassociate the eating of meat from the worship of his gods, his false gods. And now he thinks that you are uh, possibly doing that as well. So you're actually preaching a poor gospel that way. Um, the, the, those are the circumstances I would maybe say, like if you go out drinking with the boys, 
they're all getting drunk and they think, oh, the Christian, yeah, he partakes too. Um, that may be an occasion where you're actually communicating something false about holiness, even though it's perfectly fine for you to partake. And so it, it, it's not just toward unbelievers, but at the same time, my concern is not like whether an unbeliever feels like he can't hang out with me because, you know, I partake in something or whatever. It's really the believer that I'm concerned about primarily. Yes. Right. Right. And I think that's his point with saying, like, you're going to diminish your witness and opportunity with Jews if you're sitting there eating unkosher, right? Or non-kosher. I don't know what the terminology would be. Um, and so Paul says, then I'm, I'm eating kosher because I don't want to diminish that. I want to. I want to have that opportunity. I want to. I'm trying to save people, because I'm. My focus is on others, not what I can do and what I'm allowed to do. You're allowed to do anything, because the world is yours. You rule with Christ. It all belongs to you. Now use it like Jesus used it, and love other people with it, rather than seeking your rights. This sounds like just preferring Yeah, it is. It's honoring others above yourself. It's loving others as Jesus loved us. Notice the change in that commandment. It, it's, not, it's not anymore love your neighbor as yourself. It's love one another as I have loved you, which is I have loved you more than myself. So I've put you up higher than me. That's what love looks like. I and mean, we know that. It's contrary to our culture. It's contrary to our church culture, I think. Uh, American church culture is extremely selfish. And we just, we need, look, if we're trying to build com community, we want to do it. We want to make a Christian community here. And that's what we're going for. We want to get out of the American way of doing things. And we want to create a community of love and uh, inclusion of other believers. You know, I, I don't want to include the unrepentant uh, person or whatever who claims to be a believer, right? I want to be exclusive there, but I want to include all Christians, I want everybody at the table then. I don't want to exclude anybody. One of the things we were talking about in uh, the music ministry side of things was how a lot of churches will um, cater to a particular little niche group in their music. Right? Mm -hmm. This will be the, uh, I don't know, the Christian rap church, or this will be the, the country music church, or this will be the yeah. rock and roll church, or whatever. Um, rock and roll church? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think so, but in their music, right, they end up dividing the body of Christ. Yeah. They cater to this particular little niche group. And then the people who don't like rock and roll or don't like country music go to the other church that caters to their little niche group. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a similar thing about, you know, what the church becomes in its, in its niche. Yeah. Right? Well, this is the um, 20 somethings with no kids church. Right? right. Or this is the church that likes to play soccer. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Bikers for Jesus. Ballerinas for Jesus. Uh, geriatrics for Jesus or whatever, you know. It's like, uh, how about Christians for Jesus? And that's period. That's it. Like, why, why is it an extra group? Don't bring your hobbies in. You're, you're, you're elevating your hobbies above Christ. Again, it's fine to get together and do things that are, you know, that you have hobbies. It's fine to have friends or whatever within the church. It becomes a problem if that becomes your church. It becomes a problem if people feel like, man, I really want to be a part of that group, but I can't be because I'm being pressured now. And re remember, the overarching problem in Corinth is division, is groups. Well, I'm of this group. I'm, a, I'm Paul's group. Well, I'm Peter's group. Well, I'm Apollos' group. 
well, I'm the group that speaks tongues and you're the group that prophesies and you're the group that, you know, heals or whatever. And yet we have different groups. And, and Paul's like, we're all one body. What are you doing? And you, that group, needs this group if you're to grow in Christ and to grow in love. And now you've separated yourselves out. You're growing like Gollum. You want to grow into a full hum- the full humanity of Jesus Christ? You need one another. Include everyone. Don't go off into groups. Yeah. Now what are they going to do? Bring over soccer balls, eat cakes, and stuff like that to remind you of your soccer playing days. Well, you you're you're now in the disabled church, so we'll put you over there. I mean, it, it, look, we we do this within the church. We have church. We have children's church, then we have adult Sunday school, and then we have children's Sunday school, and that's between, uh, you know, segmented up the way that our secular culture segments children. Who, where did Jesus tell you to do that? It's ridiculous. We divide even when we're at the same building. I like the fact that you included both those names for it, though. Just, uh... <laughs> but groups, when you're on like a certain group or whatever, is only talking high, high level theology or philosophies all the time. And that person feels intimidated to come and even sit down and speak or be in part because they don't even know where they, where they can fit in. Is that something that's completely different? I, I, so let me say, I think it's a different issue. Uh, I would say yes to be mindful of it. <clears throat> I do also think, though, that I, I think the majority of the church needs to learn to sit down and just listen and learn. And so when it comes to something like that, because you don't, you know, no one's making anybody sin by, you know, speaking high theology or something. Um, but sitting down and learning to where you are growing in your knowledge of those things so that you become a part of the conversation that way. I hope that no one would feel excluded. Um, but you might be excluded at first to speak, but that's fine. You know, most of my kids, when they sit down, they're, they're interested to, to listen, but man, they, they barely speak. They're, they're just listening. They're trying to, and, and then, you know, after everybody leaves, they'll be like, dad, what do you think about this? Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I, I know there's a move to uh, try to get everything to, and, and I don't want to speak so over people's heads they don't understand what I'm saying. I want clarity. At the same time, every culture has a language if it's going to be cohesive. If you're going to be bound to one another, there isn't a language that you adopt with one another. And Christianity, I think, has this language. I think it's good for people to learn it. Not only the language of our culture in this time, but throughout history, it has had a culture of language that it has used, theological terms it uses to mean certain things or whatever. I think it's good for Christians to learn that. Um, And so what I would actually uh, maybe encourage that person to do is if you're not familiar with a term, which a lot of people aren't, never be embarrassed. Or, or if I can say it this way, be a fool for one minute rather than a fool your whole life by asking a question. And um, because, look, we're a teaching church. I love to teach people. I love to tell them, hey, this is what this means. No one thinks you're stupid. No one, it's not like you're born with that information, right? So, yeah, I would just say, uh, say apply it in that way. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I personally, I, I actually think one, one of two things happens, right? So, and I get caught in this as well, the first one. The first one is, is that you become so accustomed to words, you don't realize they're high and lofty anymore because it's just part of the community. You're, you know, I'm, I'm conversing with people, watching things, reading things that use this language night and day. So to me, it's just part of regular language. I don't realize, Allison has to say sometimes, use a lot of big words, and I, and I didn't even know it. Um, so there's that, maybe becoming aware in that sense, because I want to be clear, and I don't want to necessarily do that uh, unnecessarily. But the other reason why big words are used is, frankly, I think a lot of people that use them don't understand them, them themselves. And the reason why they're using big words is because they don't understand the concepts well enough to, clear, to clearly speak them in just regular English. Um, for those people, I think it would be helpful to have other people who don't understand the words because they themselves can start thinking, oh, what do these words mean, you know, more precisely. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think it can be nothing but good if you continue to sit among uh, people who are, you know, using lofty words and speaking theology and all that. Yeah, ask questions. There's nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, we're all learn. Disciple literally means learner. We're, if we're not, if we're all, we're all disciples of Christ, so we're all learners. We're we're at different places, but man, who who knows as much as as Christ? Nobody. So. <laughs> that was funny. It was like, who knows as much as Christ? Lori's like, oh wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Well, that, that's what I was trying to convey there. They can even learn, like, um, they themselves are using terms that they may not even thought about very well until uh, baby Christian brings it up and asks a question. I learn a lot in terms of, oh, you know, I, I had this general concept, but now this baby Christian is asking me a question that I hadn't really thought about in this dimension or whatever, and now I have to actually learn more about that thing. So... I actually think the people the, the people who learn the most in this church are the elders. I hope that you realize that. Um, because we're constantly trying to learn to, to teach you, but we're also learning from you when you ask us questions. And frank, frankly, God teaches a lot on the fly. Uh, I think the Spirit of God brings stuff to our minds when you guys ask questions. It's like, oh, I never thought about that. Or, or you, you have a question and he gives us an answer we never actually thought about before. Right. Yeah, try explaining something to a kid and see how well you understand it. It's really hard. And that shows you you don't understand it as well as you thought. Yeah. That, that's exactly it. The smartest people are the people who explain things simply, not the people who use huge terms. Again, I'm not, I'm not throwing off the huge terms. I think everyone should learn them. But but also be able to explain it in, in simple terms. Again, it's all about uh, receiving, not excluding, not creating these groups, which is Paul's primarily, primary concern, and here creating a group to where you'd even be pressuring people to possibly sin. That, that's the big thrust. All right, any other uh, comments, questions? All right, let's go ahead and end in prayer. Jesse, you want to pray us? Amen. Thanks, guys.